Hepatitis B is a global health threat. This is a major cause of death every year, maybe close to a million people. It's a combination of liver cancer at about 600,000, and then a large number of people dying of cirrhosis and its complications. Of course, hepatitis B is an infectious disease. It's 100 times more infectious than HIV, and it's a leading cause of liver disease alongside hepatitis C. Liver cancer, as you know, is the second leading cause of cancer deaths in the world. This is vaccine preventable. The word hepatitis means inflammation of the liver. It doesn't always mean a viral infection, and it doesn't always mean alcohol. So we really have to subdivide the word hepatitis into acute and chronic, and what is the actual cause. People with acute hepatitis B or chronic hepatitis B can present with a variety of different symptoms, including jaundice, abdominal pain, abdominal distension, edema, even mental confusion. So this is very important to take that history but link it back to the patient's history and laboratory tests. Hepatitis B can cause acute disease, of course, and because hepatitis B is incurable, once a person has cleared hepatitis B from their blood, they still have residual hepatitis B in their liver. But if they remain surface antigen positive, that indicates chronic infection in the blood and the liver, and that can lead to cirrhosis, liver cancer, liver transplant, and death. There are two main populations at risk for hepatitis B. There's the group of patients that acquire it at birth from their mother, and there are those that do or are exposed to high-risk events as, say, adolescents or as adults. If someone acquires hepatitis B as a newborn, that infection is highly likely to be chronic long-term. When an adult acquires hepatitis B, they have a high chance of clearing surface antigen from their blood, but as we mentioned before, there's often or always residual virus left in their liver. So in the US, the Asia Pacific Islander community is dominant in terms of at risk for hepatitis B infection, carrying hepatitis B and its complication. But indeed, the Sub-Saharan African population and East African population are at risk for hepatitis B as well. And you have to recall in this part of the world, Delta infection is common. So Delta antibody testing is very important. We think there's about 2.2 million people in the US with hepatitis B today, denoted by surface antigen positivity. When we talk about hepatitis B, just like with any type of viral hepatitis, we need to understand the tests that we do, the tests we order, how to interpret those tests. This is really pretty simple. The first test is hepatitis B surface antigen. This is a protein made by the virus in the liver cells that's pushed out into the blood and measured by the laboratory. But surface antigen means current or active infection. Another test is called core antibody. This antibody means exposure to hepatitis B. But as we mentioned, when someone's been exposed to hepatitis B, since it's incurable, it stays in the liver lifelong. Surface antibody indicates immunity or protection from hepatitis B, but that protection is only of surface antigen and core antibody are negative. So three tests, Three simple rules, keep that in mind if you would, when thinking about hepatitis B. There is another type of viral hepatitis that can be carried with or super infection on top of hepatitis B, and that's called delta hepatitis or hepatitis D. This is the most deadly form of viral hepatitis that can affect the liver. So people who have hepatitis B we believe at the Hepatitis B Foundation, everybody should have a Delta or D antibody blood test performed. And if positive, that Delta antibody indicates the person should be tested by another level of testing called PCR. This is a way to measure the Delta virus if it's present, yes or no. So Delta is treatable, although a little bit more difficult to treat. And Delta is preventable. If you vaccinate for B, you prevent B. 
you prevent this very deadly form of viral hepatitis. There's a number of populations that need to be tested for hepatitis B. We at the Hepatitis B Foundation, based in Doylestown, Pennsylvania, think all adults should be tested for hepatitis B. But this hasn't quite worked its way through the CDC or the Preventative Health Services Task Force. So when we're thinking about this, we need to also think about special populations or risk testing. So healthcare providers, emergency workers, uh, patient who use IV drugs or other illegal drugs, sex partners of infected individuals, and people who practice high-risk sex, blood exposure. Individuals in countries born where hepatitis B is more common. So we think about Mongolia. We think about Latin America and the Caribbean. So the Hispanic population is part of this at-risk group. Inmates and staff at correctional institutions and all pregnant women need to be tested. Hepatitis B is spread by intimate contact and exposure to blood or body fluids. But remember, this is not spread by shaking hands or kissing or aerosol like the coronavirus. This really requires intimate contact. That could be tattooing in an unsafe environment or dental procedures in an unsafe environment. Think about this also about the issue of direct contact, maybe with blood if you're caring or someone's caring for somebody with an open wound or an open sore. And we already spoke about, but I want to reinforce the risk of vertical transmission. That means mother to baby transmission, baby at birth. Let's go into a little bit more depth about the long-term effects of hepatitis B. So someone might go into a provider's office and just have elevated liver enzymes and not have any symptoms at all. But we have discovered that hepatitis B can cause just general symptoms, what we call constitutional symptoms, fatigue, malaise, just not feeling well, not having much energy. But later, as this causes scarring in the liver and scarring when it's in its more severe form, is called cirrhosis, can then result in liver failure, fluid on the belly, swelling on the ankles, mental confusion, abnormal coagulation, elevated liver function called a bilirubin or a low albumin or abnormal clotting, liver failure leading to transplant or death, liver cancer, Liver cancer can occur without liver failure. It can occur in people with cirrhosis, including patients with cirrhosis and advanced or far reached liver disease. At this time, we're going to take a little deeper dive into vaccination. This is called a vaccine preventable disease. This virus is discovered in the late 1960s, a vaccine developed in the 1970s and a more global rollout of the vaccine took place between the 1980s and currently. This can prevent hepatitis B infection and therefore it's an anti-cancer vaccine. Originally, we had these three dose hepatitis B vaccines and there's two of them still available globally. In the US, we've been very fortunate recently, we have the addition of a two dose vaccine. It has an equal safety profile but much higher antibody response after two doses. So you can imagine the compliance and adherence with a two-dose regimen is very, very substantial. And this is what I use in my practice. We have to think about treatment for hepatitis B in two different compartments or two different sections. Acute hepatitis B, most of the time it resolves, although occasionally patients go into liver failure and need a liver transplant. And of course, those acute hepatitis B patients need to be checked for Delta or hepatitis D, as we mentioned previously. Chronic hepatitis B is not curable, but it's suppressible. That means we can lower the amount of virus in the blood and probably lowering the virus level in the liver as well. When we lower the virus level, we decrease the risk of cirrhosis, transplant, death, and liver cancer. We have three first-line medicines used in the U.S. and around the world, and second-line medicines should not be used. So first-line is three different medicines. One's called TDF, type of tenofovir. There's a more advanced tenofovir called TAF. It has less risk of bone and kidney problems that we can see with TDF. 
And the third is entecavir. These medicines are dosed once a day and are highly effective at suppressing virus. Occasionally, these treatments actually clear surface antigen from the blood. I don't like to use the word cure, but we have talked about this as functional cure. But remember, every patient, every individual remains with a little bit of hepatitis B in their liver, even if they clear surface antigen. These medicines are very safe. Resistance is zero or close to zero with them. And long-term medicine is required though, just like maybe you would have with diabetes or high blood pressure. It's a chronic disease. So taking the medicine long-term is needed. We need patients to be compliant, adherent, to take their medicine on schedule. And if they stop the medicine, they must tell their provider to be monitored for flares or more significant liver injury if the virus comes back. It's extremely important to be tested for hepatitis B. We mentioned that we think at the Hepatitis B Foundation that all adults need to be tested for hepatitis B and children and adolescents in special settings. This is a silent disease. Silent meaning if there are symptoms, they're not pointing directly to the idea of hepatitis B. So testing, this three test panel that we discussed, very simple, inexpensive, and it really would link people to care or to vaccine if they needed it, or in those unusual patients who have this special core antibody, education about risk for reactivation, and also education that they don't need vaccine. Why we need action today. Hepatitis B, we believe acute new infections in the US could be as high as 80,000. And since it's incurable, most people clear, but still have residual virus. This is very important, but when they have acute infection, they can transmit it to other people. Same thing with chronic disease. We're thinking that in the US, there's 2.2 million individuals who have hepatitis B surface antigen today. And the number of people dying from hepatitis B could be in the five to 15,000 range. Sometimes people aren't tested, so we're really not sure about what the real incidence and prevalence of hepatitis B is. The CDC has written a beautiful plan with Health and Human Services to come up with a roadmap for hepatitis B elimination by 2030. It's a very aggressive, very wonderful, very detailed plan that was just released recently. But testing is essential. If we don't test, we don't find the chronic disease. We don't test. We can't find the individuals who need vaccination and protection. Globally, we think there's 292 million people infected with hepatitis B. As we mentioned previously, I wanna emphasize, it could be up to a million deaths from hepatitis B. So we need testing, linkage to care, linkage to treatment as essential next steps. There are many new medicines in the pipeline that may result in a higher functional cure rate and may also result in a true cure, getting rid of the virus completely. Remember, this is a vaccine preventable disease.